Islamic Arts and Crafts Part 3 and 4 The subject of painting within the context of the arts of the Islamic lands often raises the question of whether this form of art, considering the commonly acknowledged prohibition of figurative imagery in Islam, can really be perceived as Islamic. The truth is, while there is a consensus among scholars that figurative imagery has been understood as prohibited, there are no references in the Muslim holy book to this specific subject. It is rather expressed as the prohibition of constructing through technical skills that leads to self-alienation of individuals. This understanding also seems to be consistent with the interpretation of the Ten Commandments that prohibits making of any graven images if we understand the graven images not as carved images but rather what is produced through technical skills. Hence it does make sense to perceive it this way since Islam sees itself as a continuation of the other two Abrahamic traditions. So the remaining question is what do we do with all the figurative imagery found? Since the time of the Umayyads and the continuation of the fresco painting and later the illuminated manuscripts, the art of painting has had a place within the different cultures impacted by Islam. Although there is a clear distinction made between art made for sacred and secular purposes, based on the understanding of prohibition of figurative imagery, painting figures to accompany the contents of books of history, poetry, and later even just albums called muraqa, comprising of the loose leaf images and calligraphies, has been an important part of the arts produced in the Islamic lands. Therefore, in order to get through the problem of dealing with the issue of imagery, we must put into context in each case the production of such art within its own regional and cultural preferences. To be sure, there are influential elements found in the examples of such visual works that reflect characteristics characteristics of Far Eastern as well as pre-Islamic Middle Eastern regions. For the most part, this segment of chapter 4 in this segment of chapter 4 I have focused on the examples of illuminated manuscript and I will also be briefly and I will also be briefly discussing a couple of issues on the theory namely perspective and color in this lecture. The examples discussed are associated with regions such as Tabriz, Maraghe and Shiraz in present-day Iran, Harat in present-day Afghanistan, Istanbul, Turkey, Mosul in Iraq, as well as India. The World History or Jamia Tawarikh by Rashid ad din is among the books that includes figurative imagery and reveals appropriations from Chinese paintings. In two examples from this book of 1314 produced in Tabriz, Abraham Entertaining the Angels and the Valley of the Dry Bones, Death and Resurrection, we see two stories both echoed from the Old Testament. On the first image, on the left side, we see a figure, Abraham seated, with the three angels standing in front of him, separated by a tree. On the right side, we see Sarah in the interior space, signaled by the separating draped curtain in the middle. The second named example is about a traveler passing through a place with a dilapidated building in the background and a decaying body of an animal in the foreground. Stylistically, the treatment of the figures the folds on the fabric and the columns reflect the consistency of the same style. The stylization of the tree and stream in the second image shows the Chinese influence more directly. The composition seems simplified in comparison to Chinese painting by keeping almost all elements on the foreground and clearly compartmentalizing each part of it. While these examples did not make an attempt to show the depth of space, we do see the overlapping of figures and objects that convey there is a space. 
but the scale of the figures are not affected and that contributes to all the elements appearing as if they are in the foreground. The issue of space and perspective in the two-dimensional art of the Eastern cultures in general is handled different than what we might expect in a Western painting of, say, 15th and 16th century. In fact, the issue of perspective is one that is worth noting in the art of painting in the Middle East post-Islam. In the two examples from 13th century Iraq, notice how the prominent figure in the middle stands out due to its larger scale. Furthermore, the arrangement of the courtiers and the angels is reminiscent of Byzantine art with the angels holding the wind-blown cloth of honor above. The subject is of the ruler of northern Iraq following the Mongol invasion of the Middle East. His name is Badr din Lolo, which is written on his, arm on his armband. A similar composition is also implemented in two other works, the frontispiece from the Kitab al-Diryaq or the Book of Antidotes and from a copy of Maqam hariri in Saljuk style that were produced in Iraq and Egypt earlier. Later, in the final years of the Later in the final years of 13th century, a noteworthy book called Manafi al Hayawan Uses of Animals by Ibn Bakhtishu was produced and illuminated in Marokat during the Ilkhanid period. In this book, the text can be found on the same page on which the illustration of the species of animals being discussed is portrayed. Stylistically speaking, this book too reveals many characteristics of Chinese painting, such as the stylized tree trunk in the image on the right and the depiction of the head and neck of the second horse, which is seen as a convention of expressing the continuous nature of the material presented. By 15th, 16th and 17th century, the art of painting had reached a higher degree of quality and complexity while still holding on to the conventions appropriated from elsewhere. And the painting on the left from Temurid, dated 1430 in Herat, the degree of ornamentation overpowers the figures that are by now much smaller in relationship to their surroundings. Interestingly, the Chinese convention in showing beautiful and graceful ladies by painting flowing sashes is seen in this painting as well. The horizon line is raised and the blocks of text are set within the illustration. The night sky above the high horizon line is seen in the Temurid image. The night sky above the high horizon line seen in the Temurid image also appears in the Safavid example. The colors and the geometric shapes interpreted as the building are distinctly different from the garden scene in the first painting, which reveals a very different mood appropriate for the subject, and that is the night and the passion in the narrative. Sometimes the illustration recorded a historic moment of visiting a head of state, or in this case, or, in the case of these paintings, the Persian Safavid ambassadors, Shah Quli's, the Persian Safavid ambassador Shah Quli's gifts being presented to the Ottoman Sultan Selim II. The two facing pages showed the Ottoman servants carrying series of gifts like carpets and other valuable objects toward the Sultan, who is seated at the uppermost right-hand side with Shah Ali bowing in front of him as the two Ottoman chamberlains stand at his either sides. The text, written in the form of Persian poetry, has been confined within the blocks up at the top. During the Safavid, the art of painting reached such an impressive technical level that itself became influential. The turco mongol rulers of India, known as Mughals, who ruled northern India from 16th to the 18th century, centered in Agra, 
by modeling their imperial Atelier after the Persian royal workshops learned from the Persian artists, but transformed the Persian style into a more naturalistic and lively style that was more consistent with their own artistic heritage. This style also influenced another regional style known as Rajput in use by the Hindu rulers who remained in charge of their own regions under the Mughal rule. The image on the right clearly shows more figurative qualities found in Mughal style and contrasts clearly with the abstract style of the painting on the left, which is incidentally of the same subject, reflecting the story of Krishna and the beloved Radha associated with the Bhakti tradition, a spiritual movement since the 7th century popular in India. It must be clear by now how influential the pre-existing traditions were in the areas impacted by Islam and how these traditions found their way into Islamic thoughts and interpretations. I found the next examples so intriguing that I could not ha that I could not leave them out. The Egyptian Hajj painting that mixes an Islamic ritual with the thousands of years of the ancient tradition of fresco painting in Egypt. The ritual of Hajj is one of the pillars of Islam, as you recall, and it is a duty for those who become eligible by reaching certain stage in their lives. It is a pilgrimage to Mecca and performing the required rituals. The individual completing the pilgrimage will become highly respected and honored among the people of his or her community. Therefore, in Egypt, using the fresco painting, the, ha the Haji or Hajia, that is the title the man or the woman earns upon their returning, would commission an artist to depict highlights of their trip on the walls of their houses for all to see. Some include the vehicle by which they made the trip, others will have themselves painted in as performing their rituals. In the image at the top right, the standing figure closely resembles the ancient Egyptian style and canon of painting figures. The subject of the image on the bottom left is the sacrifice of Abraham that comes at the end and signals the completion of the ritual. In this image, the artist has creatively used the window on the wall as an altar upon which the ram brought by the angel Gabriel, his name indicated in the text behind his wings, is placed. While these images tell us about people's values and experiences, they are made possible by patrons. In art history, one of the questions we ask is who paid for the work of art, since obviously building and producing works of architecture and art is quite costly. The issue of patronage in Islam is seen as an act of generosity, particularly for public works, sometimes done through religious endowments or waqf, or by the order of a just ruler. For this reason, building a caravansarai, or a wayside inn, for instance, that houses that house travelers along the road was seen as a role was seen as the deed of a good ruler since women had their own money under the islamic law they too were among active patrons. Since women had their own money under the Islamic law, since women had their own money under the Islamic law, they too were among active patrons. There is also the issue of authority and terms such as qadi or the religious judge and muhtasib who would oversee the production of art to ensure its compliance with religious tenets and beliefs. The production of textile with official inscriptions of, or tiraz 
was exclusively done for the caliphs during the Abbasid reign and was presented to individuals to acknowledge their services and loyalty to the caliph. The technical workshops and skills were of course highly valued and eventually with the formation of the guilds the craftspeople were more strengthened in terms of having some control over the production of their arts and crafts. <laughs>